Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm also doing this for the first time. Uh, <laughs> and uh, right, so uh, my name is Sturz, and I've been working on the UTOS project for a little while. Uh, I'm not the original creator, but I uh, help maintain it now. Uh, and I'm going to be talk talking to you about that and how we try to be compatible with the uh, original GNU core utils. So this is me. Uh, my name is Dertz. I'm a recent graduate uh, with a, I got a CS master's degree now. Um, I'm a maintainer on UUtils since 2021. I love programming languages. Come talk to me about them. Um, and also, of course, I'm here, so I love Rust. Um, the UUtils core utils are a cross-platform re-implementation of the core utils in Rust. Now, uh, many of you might know that, uh, what that is, but uh, what are the GNU core utils? Well, these are the GNU core utils. It's a lot of them. Um, it's over a hundred of them, and these are the little, you know, little commands that you usually have access to in Bash, and they are all implemented as executables. Um, so Bash, on its own, can do basically nothing. Um, While well, it can do some things like string manipulation, uh, but that's basically where it ends. Uh, if you even want to like have things like true and false, uh, well, you're going to have to use true and false from this list over here, um, and you can do things like uh, listing files, copying files, moving files, lots of file things, um, counting words, you know, all those things. Um, so the way that I've been thinking about it is it's basically sort of a standard library uh, for Bash. And um, the GNU core utils are written in C. Uh, they're maintained by the GNU project, by the FSF. Uh, and these people have been doing an amazing job. Um, honestly, I love what they're doing. They're keeping this uh, project alive for, well, many, many years now, many decades. Um, but still, uh, we want to modernize them a little bit while also trying to be compatible. So a brief history of UUtils. It started all the way back in 2013, which is two years before Rust 1.0, which is kind of impressive, um, by this guy called Jordi Bojano. And then several maintainers have taken over the, over, uh, over the years. Uh, and then finally, in 2020, uh, this guy called Sylvester uh, he works at uh, Mozilla in Paris, and then he needed a COVID project, basically. So he took over, <laughs> and he gave this project a little bit more direction. And the direction that he wanted to focus on was compatibility. So really strictly new compatibility. Uh, and then currently, uh, there's three active maintainers, Sylvester, Daniel, and me. Um, and I'm going to be here explaining to you what that is all about. So why do we want this compatibility? Well. There's so much right now on all of your systems, if you're using Linux mostly, that is relying on these utilities that changing changing the implementation without, a, if the implementation is not compatible, you're not going to adopt it because too much is going to break. So we need that compatibility if we want to have any chance at adoption. Um, GNU is the most familiar and the most, yeah, the most common implementation of this. So that's what we're going to be uh, compatible with. Now, they're used so much that every single quirk of these things is used by someone, which is kind of annoying for me. Uh, but it's also very interesting, and it makes the implementation very interesting. I've included a little uh, image over here, which is the uh, number of tests that we pass on the GNU test suite. So on every PR, um, we check how many of the GNU tests we pass. You can see the green line, it's going steadily, maybe a little bit slowly, but steadily um, going, <laughs> it's going up. Um, the problem is of course, and I'm hitting my microphone again, the problem is of course that C is not Rust. So what the, the problem that that presents is that um, the things that are easy to do in C are not the things that are easy to do in Rust. So if you just, you know, give two developers two different languages and let them implement the same thing, there's a big chance that they're going to implement totally different things under the hood, right? It might look somewhat the same on the surface, but the actual details of what is actually happening are going to be very different. Um, and that's kind of also the thesis of this talk, like the language determines the implementation of whatever you're doing. And for us, that presents a problem because the things that we want to do in Rust are different from the things that the GNU project wants to do in C. Um, but we have to be compatible with them. So we have to figure out ways to use Rust and use all the advantages of Rust while also staying a little bit in like that C-like area of things. 
And I want to explore this a little bit with you now um, in two case studies. Uh, it's about the error handling of uutils and also about the argument parsing of uutils. Um, and the argument parsing is still a little, little bit of a work in progress, so you're going to get a little bit of a preview. Um, okay, so we're going to do some. We're going to just look at what C is doing, what Rust is doing, and then how we try to bridge that gap for both of these. So, what does error handling look like in C? Well, the GNU core details do this. Um, they print some message, and then they exit with some exit code, right? Zero for success, one or something else for failure. Um, they actually have loads of different things. Some utilities exit with 125, some with like two for some things, one for other things. You need a lot of control over the exit code. And what they do is they print the message always immediately. And then uh, they either exit the program, just called the equivalent of std process exit, right? Um, or they store the exit code for later. So if you have, for example, multiple files that you want to process, let's say multiple files that you're removing with the rm command, then uh, if one of them fails, it will still try to do the other ones. It's just going to print the error and remember that a failure has happened and then exit with uh, a one exit code. In Rust, we want to use result, right? We want to use this beautiful thing, result, uh, which has nice uh, question mark support, and we can match on it, and we can do all these fun things that we're used to in Rust. Um, it also tells us which functions can fail, um, and just generally generally leads to nicer APIs. Um, so if we want to exit, that's fine. We just bubble up the error all the way to main, and then we exit. But then we get into trouble, because we needed that control over the exit code. Now, there is some support of this in the standard library. There's a termination trade. Um, but we had to do, we need a little bit more flexibility still. Um, so we had to come up with our own thing. So what we want in the style of Rust, control the exit code. Um, and we want to do these new things. And also, we're doing a lot of I.O. related things. That's what these utils are mostly for. Um, so we need to work well with I, uh, just the standard library I.O. errors. So we came up with this. Uh, this is a little trait. Um, and it just extends the uh, normal error uh, trait with an additional method called code. And that's just going to give us the exit code that is uh, that corresponds to this uh, error type. And then we just uh, make a nice result for that. Um, as you do, we like to prefix everything with a u uh, because it's u utils. <laughs> and uh, uh, we box up the error just so we can have night. A nice, like, anyhow, like, uh, error handling. OK. Um, then we also do this. So we do um, some call to some I.O. thing. And then we just want to attach some context to it um, so that you don't just get permission denied without any context. We want to like, get, like, oh, we tried to do this, but that didn't work because of um, the error that we get. Um, and we have this also. You also have this trait for that. And now we we're already getting very close. Now the only thing that we need still need to do is remember the exit code. Now this is where it gets a little bit less idiomatic rust, um, but still very convenient uh, because we can do this. So we made this little macro. We give it an error, uh, one of these u errors. Um, then it's just going to store the exit code. We have some. I32 that we store somewhere. It's an, uh, an atomic I32. Um, and we just say, well, remember this exit code for me. And that feels very magical. But the thing is that it's exactly what we needed to do. It fits exactly our use case. OK, so result is great. Um, and the nice thing about Rust is that you actually need to think about how you're designing your error path. Right? Your happy path is as important in Rust as the uh, error path. Um, and we just uh, had to do some of our custom error handling um, and make some custom abstractions over that. But we chose, at least for the exit code, we chose a little bit of practicality over sort of purity of the Rust style. OK, so that's all already implemented in UUtils right now. Um, the second thing is a little bit more experimental. I have it on my own repository somewhere. Um, it is uh, different argument parsing. So again, let's look at what C is doing. In C, you get this um, code. Uh, yeah, I don't like. <laughs> um, 
I do not like this style, uh, personal preference, I suppose. Uh, what this is doing is it's, it's a while loop and it's gonna give you the next argument uh, each time. Now um, it's a C loop. So you're gonna do an assignment in the condition and then checking whether that is equal to minus one, which is the error code. And that's when you stop the while. And then you're switching on the character that you get, which is of course also equal to the number because it's a byte and it's C and it's car and it's like, um, <laughs> the thing that you do, uh, so uh, if uh, then there's that string up there, which is sort of the specification of the uh, of your argument parsing, right? So it's saying there's an A flag and there's a B flag and because they're code, ooh, now everything broke. Can you guys still hear me? Oh, okay, that sounds weird. Um, Cool. So there's the colon. I'm going to stand very still. Um, there's that colon, which indicates that B is going to take uh, some value. Uh, that's what the colon means. So that means that when getopt is going to find that B, it's also going to modify that global variable called optarg um, that you see there. Um, and then we can assign that to wherever you want it to be. And you know, if if things fail, then we just abort. We can do nice error hand or uh, sort of nice error messages there. Uh, nothing here is automatic. Um, it's modifying globals. It's like the switch is not exhaustively checked. Um, right? The error messages is not are not automatic. The help uh, is not automatic. The completions are not automatic. Um, we're specifying our arguments as a string. Uh, I, I think this is kind of ugly. But this is the stuff that we have to emulate. Uh, in Rust. So what does Rust like to do? Uh, well, we like to use clap. Um, I guess you can choose your argument parser of choice, but clap is one of the most uh, popular and Hueutils is using it as well. Well, we, and we got a lot of nice things, right? We got automatic help, uh, error messages, completions. Um, and what it, it tries to do is it tries to collect every um, value that you parse or every, every argument collects that into some final data structure. Now, what that data structure is depends on the API that you're using. If you're using the Builder API, then you can basically query some hash map-like structure. It's like saying, okay, well, give me, give me the value that is passed as uh, to the argument A, right? Um, if you do a derive API, then it all gets much nicer. Everything gets nicely parsed into your own custom struct, um, which is lovely. And it would be lovely if we could use that in UUTILS as well, but we can't because the Derive API is a little bit less flexible uh, than what we needed to do. Um, and we get into really weird cases. So here's one, right? Uh, there's the dash O flag of LS that does two things. It's the same as dash L, which you might be familiar with, right? Just giving files with all the information, like the, the time and the owner and the group and like a bunch of other things. Um, but it also hides the group from that information. So the O stands for owner, but it hides the group uh, so that you're only left with the owner. That's what it's doing. Um, not my API design. Um, uh, so the thing is that it's sort of partially overridden by other things. It's not cleanly mapping one argument to one value in our uh, struct list settings, right? It's doing two things at the same time. And Clap does not like that. So we have to do a bunch of weird things with like checking the indices of where things were passed and then figuring out how that all fits together. Um, and the code is a mess. I, I had it on the slide, I deleted it because it's too much of a mess. Um, <laughs> so there's even more, right? There's some weird arguments throughout the core utils. Uh, there's th this thing, just a minus 10, that just works in, in head and tail uh, if you just want to get like the first 10 lines. Uh, so it's like a shorthand for like numeric arguments. And then there's also um, other small like incomp incompatibilities like um, using, if you do like this uh, dash s uh, equals, so s is the separator of uh, sec, right? Um, in GNU, this would be parsed as the equals is the separator for sec but now we're parsing it as like the separator of the argument. So we're getting an empty string at the end, uh, which is just like these tiny things that sneak in. And that's kind of our problem, right? The defaults of clap are completely different than what we needed to do, even though clap is great if you can design something from scratch. 
but we don't have that luxury, sadly. Okay, so our solution is to write an entirely different argument parser, um, where instead of deriving on a struct, we derive on an enum, and we essentially make an iterator uh, like that, like matching that structure of that while loop that we had before in C, but we're then actually doing that in sort of a more Rust style. Um, so the enum represents a single argument. Um, and if we then derive on that, then the behavior that we're going to get by default is going to be the same as the behavior in the GNU core utils. Um, so it's kind of trying to get, well, not the best of both worlds, but like the best of Rust and do that structure of C that we need. Um, so here's what that looks like. So instead of deriving on a struct, we derive on uh, on an enum. And the enum has two variants in this case. It's the variant, it, this is for LS, by the way. Um, very trimmed down example of what, the, what, is, what this looks like in LS. Uh, and it's just saying, well, the first argument, uh, the first variant, there's gonna be an argument that maps to that variant, right? The, uh, the option dash A. The doc string there is gonna be the help string of the uh, of the argument as well, just like uh, the Cloud Derive API. And so that one's easy. Then we have this sort variant, and we define two arguments that are going to map to the sort variant. And that allows us to be a little bit more concise sometimes when things cleanly map to the same thing. So the dash t is a sorting by time argument. Um, so it's actually short for dash dash sort equals time. Um, so because it's this shorthand, we can map it to the same variant and just give it the value of sort time. Now, because we do dash dash sort equals word, um, this uh, derive API knows that we're gonna be expecting a, a value there. Now, how do we map this to our settings? Well, basically like we did in C, except I made a, a sort of a, a trade around this. Let me see if I can scroll this. Oh, yes. um, so essentially what we're doing is we're getting, for every argument that we get, we mutate that setting struct that we get um, with the argument. Now this gives us all that structure that we want, but still it's nice and typed in Rust and it's using enums and uh, I quite like it. <laughs> um, so the takeaway from that is that defaults matter, right? If you need to, have something very specific, then it really helps if the defaults of whatever you're doing match the defaults of what you're trying to achieve. Uh, the, the defaults of what you're using match the defaults of what you're trying to achieve. Um, and this is hopefully how we can actually prevent a bunch of incompatibilities that haven't even been noticed yet because we're doing the right thing by default. Uh, and we can take the best ideas from other libraries like Clap. Like I'm, I'm not gonna say that I made a deriving on a something for argument parsing, right? Um, that That's uh, originally like struct opts thing and then struct opt got, got into clap and now we have it too. Uh, but we can modify that a little bit, uh, remix it a little bit in our own way uh, to make it work for us. Um, so some final words. Well, we care a lot about compatibility uh, in UUtils, um, which is also why we have that graph and why we have a page on our documentation listing every single GNU test and whether we parse it or not. Um, so, um, but compatibility is hard to achieve um, and it takes a long time, which is also why that graph was, you know, slowly but steadily growing. Um, and uh, that was it, thank you. Do you wanna, do you wanna do? Uh, yeah, uh, we're gonna do questions for uh, five minutes now. So, okay. yeah. Yeah. Does anyone have any questions for Terts? Yeah, in the back. Wait. Um, I'm not gonna throw <laughs> this, contrary to popular uh... <laughs> demand. <laughs> Tradition. Much appreciated. Um, so you care about compatibility. Do you also care about your dependency tree? Is there anything you're doing to sort of keep that in check? I was wondering. Yeah, we do. So um, the the sort of baseline of what we're doing there, sort of the the uh, is we have cargo deny running, um, which is this thing that at least checks like whether there's at least no duplicates kind of things, and it also checks. Uh, um, 
licensing issues between dependencies and that kind of thing. Um, we, it is a balance we're trying to strike. So we're not really saying like we want as little, as few dependencies as possible because we also want to leverage the Rust ecosystem, but we're trying to be mindful of whatever, of what we use. Um, so it's more of a crate by crate decision um, on what we want to use, if that makes sense. Yeah, in a similar vein, um, oops. in a similar vein, um, how is binary size for you? Is that a problem? What do you like? Do you have tips for reducing that? Um, yes, actually. Um, so um, we thought it was a problem uh, for quite a long time. Our binaries seemed to be quite large uh, until we started fiddling with cargo.toml and you know, like all the uh, um, the the fat lifetime optimization uh, link time optimi lifetime link, link time optimization lifetimes or something else in Rust right uh, link time optimizations and other the opt equals s setting which is uh, optimizing for binary size but then also gives you very fast um, binaries um, so it's barely even a trade off like the trade off is essentially um, uh, it's it's compile time versus binary size essentially. Um, we, so I, the last time I saw, like I fiddle around with this, I did like a, a full, um, uh, a full run of like all sorts of different compiler settings, just like automated it and ran it like in, in a loop. Uh, and the smallest thing that we got was actually smaller than the GNU core details. Um, we're, st it, it's going to grow a little bit still. I know that for sure, because we're, for example, missing some, like localization stuff. Um, so there's a little bit more that's gonna add, that's gonna be there, but I don't think it's gonna be off by much. So I think we have time for one more question. Uh, otherwise you can come find Derek afterwards. Um... Yeah, so you talk a lot about compatibility. Is there some times where you need to sacrifice compatibility because it just doesn't make sense at all? Um, there's some cases where I want to, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, many cases where I would want to, uh, but, uh, so let's see if I can think of any examples. So one thing that we did decide is that, uh, we don't care that much about compatibility on the error path, um, which is actually also then something that we can try to improve. Um, so, uh, we have decided that on the specific error messages, that kind of thing, uh, to be to to be compatible there is both harder and it leaves out room for making something that's that we try to be better um, than the original utils. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, so thank you, Terts. Please give a big uh, round of applause to Terts. <laughs>